Thank you. Um, before I begin, how many of you were on my previous presentation? Okay, less, less than a half. Okay. Um, how are you? Are you having fun at this conference? Yay! Okay. Uh, thank you for joining or joining again. Um, this session, in this case, is about uh, Kubernetes operators in Java. My name is Alvaro Sanchez. I work for Oracle Labs, uh, working on Micronaut, which is an open source Java framework. Um, Oracle Labs is a research and development um, organization inside Oracle, uh, which is also the, the organization that maintains GraalVM that you probably have heard of. Um, and um, well, I will go quickly uh, because some of you were already uh, at this, uh, the brief presentation. Um, so, so you were, the first thing I want I wanted to tell you, please don't go. Remember this song? Please don't go. Uh, and the reason I'm, I'm telling this is because uh, Whenever we are into the Kubernetes ecosystem, it looks like everything has to be done with Go. And that's not the case. You could do it with Java, right? So, so please don't go. Please, Java, or please, Micronaut. Um, the demo code is available on GitHub in case you want to check it. So I'll give you a minute to, to take a picture. Um, I will go quickly over the Micronaut introduction because uh, I have done it before. Uh, then I will tell you the, about the Micronaut Kubernetes integration. Um, and finally, we'll do like a demo of everything working. So uh, Micronaut, uh, there's three, three things I want you to get uh, from this uh, presentation. One is that Micronaut is a modern Java framework. Uh, it was created from scratch in 2017, thinking on the type of applications that were created uh, back then. Um, so think about it. So microservices, uh, serverless functions, uh, CLIs, you name it, right? Um, and this is not like the type of applications that were created in the year 2000. Uh, so like WAR files, ear files, servlets, whatever, none of that. Uh, is being done anymore, right? So we wanted to do something from scratch, uh, thinking on uh, the architecture of today. The second thing is the general purpose Java framework is open source. Uh, you can use it for whatever you like it. Uh, people typically use it for um, uh, microservices, like REST APIs, but you can use it for, for whatever you want. And uh, the, the, three, the third idea is that it's highly optimized. Performance is a key concern uh, for the team. Uh, we focus on the startup time and the memory consumption of your applications. And we dramatically improve uh, those things by uh, moving all the, work, the workload, or most of them, to the compile phase. So we do that uh, through something called AOT, ahead of time compilation. So the idea is that all the framework infrastructure is generated at compile time, as opposed to other Java frameworks, uh, such as Spring or Jakarta EE, um, where everything is done at runtime, or most of the things are done at runtime. So we do that at compile time. So that at runtime, there's no proxy generation, no reflection, no dynamic class loading. Uh, we don't uh, scan your class path whatsoever, uh, so everything is faster. Faster in like 90% faster. Uh, it's a general purpose framework. You can use it for, with major technologies. Um, well, we're about to release version 4, so we are already uh, some years down the road. Um, there are some features I will um, skip these slides um, because it's not um, the main part of this uh, presentation. Uh, this is like a hello world, so you can see it's annotation based. 
so we, on purpose, design the framework with an annotation programming model so that those coming from Spring feel, could feel like at home. Um, there is an HTTP client, an HTTP server, uh, messaging support. There is a module called Micronaut Data, similar to Spring Data, where you can uh, define your repositories, uh, uh, support for security, similar to Spring Security, and then many other things, like, for example, something comparable to Spring Cloud, um, uh, I don't know, test containers, uh, you name it. There's different ways to create a Micronaut application. There is a website, uh, launch.micronaut.io. There is a CLI, an IntelliJ Idea Wizard, and a Visual Studio Code extension. Uh, I will skip uh, what's new in Micronaut 4 and get uh, directly into Kubernetes support. So how many of you are uh, running Kubernetes in production today? Raise your hands. Not many, OK. Um, that's good, because it uh, looks like uh, everything has to be done in Kubernetes. It's not the case, right? So, so Kubernetes is one option. Uh, so this session is obviously about Kubernetes operators. So who knows what is an operator in Kubernetes? OK, I will have to explain that. No worries. I will do that. So that's, that's one takeaway you will have from this session. You will learn what is an operator. Um, now, I want you to think on a Micronet application. It could be a Spring application or whatever. So think about an application that, that is running that you want to deploy on Kubernetes and how that application interacts with the things that are surrounding, right? Um, or what things that application could do that uh, would be possible in a different environment. Uh, so imagine about service discovery. The idea of service discovery is that you have, I don't know, the, the shopping cart microservice that needs to talk with the, uh, the orders microservice, and uh, they communicate with an HTTP client, right? So there is this question of how is one microservice uh, able to know how to make a request to the other microservice, right? Uh, this is service discovery. Service discovery is the ability to how to configure that. So to have HTTP clients that are aware of the different services of the systems. So you don't care about the actual IP or port or node that is running each particular instance. There are different ways to achieve uh, service discovery. Outside of Kubernetes, you can use console, you can use um, Oh, well, console would be like the most popular choice. Uh, but inside Kubernetes, Kubernetes has native support for service discovery. Uh, now, how would you use that in, in a Micronaut application, right? So, so imagine you don't use the, the Micronaut Kubernetes integration. So you just deploy your application, and I have one client that needs to talk to different services. So as you can see, I will have to specify the URL, like the host and the port directly. And this will map to the, to the name of the service. This works because inside Kubernetes, there is a DNS component that will resolve this host to the pod where the, the application is running. So at this, you, you can save like, um, like uh, IP resolution, right? But still, you have to deal with the port and the, the HTTP schema. So it's suboptimal. It is much better to use the integration, sorry, and to simply specify the service ID. And in this case, Micronaut will figure out via the Kubernetes API which are the endpoints where the my service is listening, right? And it will run Robin through them. You don't have to care about that. You don't have to care about uh, ports or HTTPS, anything, right? It will just work. So far, so good? Yeah? Blink, if you agree, because I can see many feedback. Um, so like I said, service discovery, uh, this ability will allow your micro application to, to easily reach out other services. Um, and by easily, is literally 
sorry, literally like this, using the service ID. Nothing else required. Well, obviously, a dependency, a configuration line, but that's, that's all. The second thing is distributed configuration. So again, you can achieve that with console. Anyone using console here? Only one, two, three, OK. Uh, the idea of distributed configuration is having enabling one application to read configuration from an external source, right? So, so typically, when you package an application like a YAR file, you ship configuration file inside, right? Like application YAML, application properties, whatever. Uh, but a Micronet application, as well as a Spring application or Quarkus application, whatever, all those frameworks are able to read configuration files from other sources. Like you, you can pass a system properties. Uh, it will, they will read uh, environment variables, right? So those are like um, coming by default on, uh, on all of them. Now, if you are on Kubernetes, there is a, an additional option, which is to use config maps and secrets at sources for configuration. So the idea is that your application is not only able to read values from application YAML or properties, uh, by the way, this file could be, this file could be uh, packaged into the, into the jar file, or it could be like an external file that will work as well, right? But in addition to that, in addition to the system properties, in addition to the uh, environment variables, you can read values from a config map, which is the benefit of this. The benefit of this is that um, you can separate the configuration part of your application from the runtime part, right? So your application is now able to read configuration values from a config map that you can create on the fly, that you can change on the fly, that you can delete on the fly while your application is running. Because Micronaut applications are refreshable. And refreshable means that there is a refresh scope that uh, whenever there is um, a refresh event, and for example, if you have this integration enabled and you're watching for changes in a config map, uh, whenever a config map changes, um, we will trigger a refresh event and your beans that are marked as refreshable will refresh on the fly without needing to, uh, to restart. I will show that in the demo. So in this case, we have a simple, simple config map with a couple of values. Username and password. Well, this is a, sort of a secret, but works the, works the same, right? Username and password, and we map them to those attributes via the add value annotation, right? In Spring, is the same. Is add value works the same? Uh, so, so now that username property is going to be resolved from the config map, right? You still follow me? Yeah. OK. Uh, this has like a different options that you can choose. Uh, for example, if you don't want to grant access to your application to the Kubernetes API for whatever reason, in the Kubernetes uh, airbag model, uh, you can mount those config maps and, as, as, uh, and secrets as volumes. And we will read those files and um, you know, enable them into the uh, property sources. Another thing that the uh, Micronet integration will give you is uh, health checks. So uh, in Spring, there is uh, the Spring actuators. Uh, in Micronet, it's called uh, Micronet Management Endpoints. Uh, and one of the management endpoints is the health endpoint that is really is crucial when you run into production because the health endpoint will allow other, um, other elements in your architecture to, to determine if your application is running or not, or is, if it's healthy or not. And then it needs to be, uh, for example, it needs to be phase out of a proxy or, or whatever, right? Uh, so the, the health endpoint or the health checks is or are composable. Uh, we can check the health of, a, or of an application based on different, different things, right? So for, like by default, there is like a disk, disk space health check, uh, memory health check, um, and I think that's it. 
but if you enable the, the magnet integration with Kubernetes, you have a Kubernetes health check specifically that will prove communication with the Kubernetes API. And uh, if you configure show, because it's uh, disabled by default, but you can explicitly enable for development, you can get additional information about where is your application coming from. This is uh, like number two, like for example, uh, the, essentially the bot where your application is running. Uh, and also if you're also using service discovery, uh, you can like uh, tell which, service, which services have been discovered, uh, which are the, uh, the IPs and boards that have been uh, discovered for those services, et cetera. So we'll give you like, uh, more info uh, when you're running on Kubernetes. Uh, another thing is the ability to easily use the Kubernetes Java client. So if your application is running on Kubernetes and needs to interact with the Kubernetes API for whatever reason, um, you can, there is, well, there's essentially two Java clients uh, that are popular for Kubernetes. One is the Fabricate uh, Kubernetes client, which is, uh, is really good. It's, um, it's maintained by, by Red Hat, essentially, or actually Eclipse Foundation. Um, and we'll, we'll give you like a rich API for um, working with the Kubernetes API. However, the uh, Kubernetes project itself uh, publishes its own client, which is called the official client, right? So this is the one we integrate with, because well, we thought this is a safer choice to, to integrate with the official client. Uh, we have the warranty that it's going to be always up to date because they auto-generate the client from the open API spec of the Kubernetes API. So it's always up to date whenever they release a new uh, Kubernetes API version. Uh, immediately there is a, a, a well, not immediately, but uh, short after there is a new version of the Kubernetes Java client available working with that uh, API. Now, you can use that uh, using that client is not as straightforward because you need to actually instantiate a couple of clients and then configure an HTTP client. So with the Magnet integration, we do that for you. You can just inject via the dependency injection mechanism of Micronaut the, the Kubernetes client of your choice, which will have been initialized by us. It will have been configured automatically with the with the Qt config um, of your choice. It is all configurable if you want to change the defaults. But uh, if you just want to interact with the Kubernetes API of the same cluster where your application is running, like, like the default, like talking locally to the Kubernetes cluster, it will just work with the defaults. Nothing else is required. And uh, the last thing is the operator support. Now, what is an operator? An operator is, um, is uh, a component that is running inside the cluster, in, inside the Kubernetes cluster, and that reacts to, to things that happen in the cluster. Like, for example, think about, <clears throat> think about uh, for example, you have a config map, YAML, locally, a YAML file with a config map. And you use kubectl apply dash f myconfigmap.yaml. What happens there? What happens there is that obviously uh, you communicate through the Kubernetes API. That is what kubectl does. It will communicate with the API. Uh, and it will create the object. But the object is just the YAML with probably more info, but uh, just about it. But the, then there is one component inside the Kubernetes cluster that will react to that and will say, OK, there is a new config map being created, so I need to store the, this into the ETCD, um, ETCD key value configuration of the cluster. Uh, same happens with a pod. You create a pod. It's a, it's a piece of a, a bunch of YAML, right? Nothing else. But who is actually starting the container. There's someone doing that, right? Which is essentially a pod controller, right? Pod controller 
is an operator, is a kind of an operator. So operators is like the general term. There are different building blocks to create operators. Controllers is, is one. And a controller will react to that and will actually start the container when you create a pod. OK? You follow me? That's an operator. So now, obviously, this is not for everybody use cases, right? So, so I, want to think, I want you to think about whether this applies to your situation or, or not. But at least you now, you now know what is an operator, right? And this is typically used with custom resource definitions. Uh, so for example, if we go back to this, um, this piece of YAML, you see this kind of secret? APA version v1, this is a core custom, re uh, a core resource from Kubernetes. It's coming like, uh, by default, but the Kubernetes API can be extended with different kinds of objects. We could create our own uh, types. And this is normally used in combination with operators because if we introduce a new custom resource definition, we can allow users to interact with, with the cluster via these custom resources. Now, the building blocks that Minecraft supports uh, for you is or are informers, uh, reconcilers, and uh, leader election mechanism. The most basic one is an informer. An informer is a, is a component that will have three lifecycle methods, three lifecycle methods on the, on the object type that you're interested in. So imagine you want to create something that it's notified when a config map is added, when a config map is uh, updated, and when a config map is removed or delete, right? So you essentially, well, doing this by hand is complex, right? But with Microsoft, it's really simple because all you have to do is create a class, uh, at the at informer annotation, you, you gotta tell us which is the 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 type, the the resource kind that you're interested in watching. Uh, there are further options to, for example, to filter based on labels, uh, if you will. And then we will do all what it takes to call your methods when any of those events will happen. Okay, so this is like a really simple building block. Uh, that you can use uh, in your applications. Now, the, mo the most advanced one is a, re a reconciler. A reconciler works differently in the way that, um, for example, um, the, if you think about the, the pod example that I told you, right? You create a pod. Or don't think uh, on a pod, think on a deployment, right? You create a deployment and you specify the number of replicas, right? So Reconciler works to constantly ensuring that the cluster state represents the configuration, right? So basically, when, when you create a deployment and you say you want to replicas, the controller will, will kick in. It's like an infinite loop, right? I will say, okay, how many replicas do I have? I have zero, so I need to create two, right? And then we'll kick it again. Now I have one, well, there is one left, I have two, I'm done. But I will keep watching, I, I will keep running until the, the cluster state matches the configuration. Now, if you remove, you remove that deployment, the same process will happen. And the controller will say, okay, there shouldn't be any replica or any instance of this deployment, but I have one, so I need to remove it. Right? You follow me? Yeah? How do you do that? Again, you can use uh, the at operator annotation, and there is a single method that you want to, to uh, that you need to implement. It is the reconcile uh, method. And this is the loop method where you where you got to check, what do I have in my cluster? What is the configuration? And what do I need to do to make them match? Yeah? Uh, let me skip this part. Uh, 
uh, we'll save it for later. Now, uh, I will show you a demo. How much time? 25 minutes, that's okay. Uh, I will show you a demo, um, but uh, before showing the demo, I want you to understand what are we going to see. Uh, imagine we have an, a new product. So I've, I've created a new product, which is called ABCDB, uh, which stands for a very cool database, because I work for Oracle, Oracle uh, the, the databases, so, so I'm pretty sure Larry will be proud of me. Uh, this is an imaginary product, right? But imagine we are a product company that we want this product to be distributed um, with a Kubernetes operator, right? When you are creating a product, um, you could do this as well with, a, with like a bespoke pr uh, project that you do for a single customer. But I think it makes more sense uh, when you have like a multiple clients that needs to install something. So you can provide them, I don't know, a jar file. So you, uh, you push the jar file on Maven Central, and they will figure out how to run that, how to configure that. Uh, that wouldn't be like really user-friendly, right? So another thing you could do is to provide them a Docker image. That's one thing that many people do, many uh, server companies do. You, you put the jar file inside the uh, Docker image, do, you push your Docker image to a registry, and you tell the users how to, you know, how to run that image. That's another thing you could do. But then people will have to, uh, if they want to run that into Kubernetes, will have to create the, the, you know, the deployment manifests. Uh, all the Kubernetes um, uh, YAML configuration for that particular image. So it, it's better than just the jar file, but not ideal. So another thing you could do is to uh, create, like, for example, a Helm chart. Right? You create a Helm chart, and then using Helm, uh, people can install your product. But again, not everybody likes Helm uh, or uses Helm or are willing to use Helm. So you're basically leaving many users uh, behind. So what if, what if we, on top of those uh, options, we allow them to use an operator to install this product, right? Uh, so this is what the demo is about. So we have uh, this ADBC, ABCDB product, which is a fake database. It does nothing. It's, it's an empty application. Uh, but it, it just exists with the purpose of being managed by an operator. Uh, it's a simple magnet application uh, that we want our customers to uh, install with an operator, right? And we are providing them with a custom resource definition so that they can uh, you know, install this product into the cluster, right? Um, this particular product is packaged as a native executable compiled with GraalVM into Docker image. Uh, and is able to read configuration from a config map um, and is refreshable. So let's see that. This is the single, the single endpoint, uh, the whole code of this application. So as you can see, it doesn't have many, many things inside. So uh, there is an add value annotation. Uh, and we have one property, key, which is abcdb.message. And then after that, it comes the default value. The default value is for when there is no result value from any property source then it will use the default value that you specify here. And um, we're using this to, to be able to tell when this is configured or not, right? Uh, so if nobody is providing a value for this property key, uh, we'll have this value. And then it simply has a, like an endpoint that will uh, output that message. But it's going to be appended with running in or outside Kubernetes because your application is also aware, can be aware, if you will, uh, if it's running inside Kubernetes or not via the environment. Right? That's all. That's everything it does. Um, so far, so good? Yeah? OK. So we could run this. If the demo gods are with me, 
they weren't uh, in my previous presentation, but uh, I'm brave. So for example, uh, this one is using Gradle, so we can do Gradle uh, run, and this should uh, run. Of course, it doesn't, because I switched off Wi-Fi. Rail run. Now is the network being slow? <coughs> you know what? Uh, I have already this uh, as a Docker image, so I will run the Docker image in, uh, instead. So. Um, uh, let me use this terminal I have here. So this is Docker run, right? That's the application. I'm a cool database. That's all it does. It runs. This Docker image has the native is executable inside. And uh, if we make a curl request to, to this guy here, Let's try that. So this is curl uh, 8080. Oh, this is failing again. No. Oh. For some reason, this worked on the browser. Not working. Never mind. Um, let's move on. So, so now this is the application, right? The, the second thing is the operator. Now, the operator is something that is already deployed uh, on the cluster, right? So, so as you can see, well. This is a bit hard to see it, but this is the, the cluster boundary, right? This is the cluster boundary. We have the operator. It's already deployed. It's in a different application than the previous one. I have already packaged the application as a, as a Docker uh, image. Uh, I, I deployed on the cluster. It's running. It's already waiting for, for what? It's waiting for a custom resource of, of kind, ABCDB that I will show you now how it looks like. So the way this works is that a user, your client, right, uh, to install this database on their cluster will create, an inst uh, will create this object with kubectl, right? We'll do kubectl apply. Actually, we will do that, right? Then the operator um, ha has a reconcile loop, as you saw before. And we'll do this, al this algorithm that I told you that uh, OK, I have one instance, one ABCDB instance that, uh, that needs to be there. Do I have a deployment for it? Do I have? Because what it takes for this application to run, it needs a config map, it needs a deployment, and it needs a service. Right? This is the thing that the operator is going to create for my application. And this deployment will actually create the, the pod, uh, and your application will read the configuration from the config map, right? So we're saving the user for, from creating all those things. Um, they don't have to care about the manifest. We control them, right? So let's see if this uh, works. Now, on the top terminal, I have a watch of the um, ABCDB resources that we have on the cluster. And as you can see, there's, there's none, right? So this is, this is like every two seconds making a request to the cluster to see if we have anything. Uh, what else? Uh, let me show you what the user will, will create. So this is. 
This is like this. Right? There is a new kind being used. Um, and uh, this is really simple, so we only have uh, one property in the specification, that is the message. And we want our application to, to read from that, right? And the rest are just labels, just to match. Uh, we will use those labels for, uh, for the deployment and the service. Uh, so that is the operator job. If we see the actual code of the operator, uh, which is this guy here, this is, the, this is the reconcile loop. Uh, so essentially, this will run periodically. Uh, you can configure um, you know, this periodicity. Uh, so that if there is an instance of an ABCDB object uh, detected, then we will see what is going on with that one. It could be that that instance is trying to be deleted. And now object deletion is a complex, uh, well, not, not complex, but uh, um, how many of you know what a finalizer is in Kubernetes? Yes, only one person, okay. Uh, this is an advanced um, um, topic. So you can ask me after this, this presentation. But essentially, uh, uh, deleting, uh, when you want to delete something in Kubernetes, uh, is not something that happens automatically, right? So there are, um, there are some techniques that uh, one has to do to uh, make an object to be deleted. Because you have to deal with corner cases, like, uh, for example, uh, in this case, we have this ABCDB object kind, which is the owner of three other objects, right? One is the deployment. The deployment is the owner of a pod, and so on and so on. So there is a chain of objects. And um, this operator needs to ensure that um, when an object is being deleted, because what actually when, when, you, when you say kubectl delete uh, minus f my file, um, the object is not immediately deleted, but it's marked to be deleted, right? So this is the way. This is essentially what the, um, what is it? Is being deleted method uh, is checking, right? So if the object is marked to be deleted, then uh, we actually delete all, all the three children. We delete the config map, we delete the, the service, and we delete the, uh, the deployment, OK? Yes? Uh, otherwise, we need to create those objects or update them. Because it could be the case that the next iteration of this method, you get a new version of an existing object. For example, if, the, if this spec message has changed, uh, then you will get like a new version. So this is what I told you. The operator needs to. Uh, check to, to ensure that the cluster state matches uh, what the user has configured, right? So it will check, OK, uh, do I have the deployment? Do I have this, the config map? No, then I have to create them. Uh, for example, do I have the config map? Yes. Is the content of the config map the same as it was specified on the expected message? Yes, no. If it's no, then I have to add the config map, blah, blah, blah. You still follow me? Yeah? There's another thing um, I don't think I told you. This controller is refreshable. Yeah? So in this case, I'm using a field configuration in injection. Uh, this is a bad practice, so don't do that. It is much better to, to do this via um, for example, constructor injection, right? Um, but I wanted to do like this because uh, um, we, can, we can tell exactly if this has been refreshed or not. So as you can tell, this is a, a private field that is going to be initialized when the bin is created, right? So how do we update the content of that message uh, field? Um, 
there's no setter or anything like that, right? So I didn't, I didn't implement that. So, so this will happen essentially via a refresh event, right? This application is configured to watch for, um, well, it's, it's having the, the integration with Kubernetes, so by default it will watch for config map changes. Uh, by default, we'll use the same labels as the, as the balls, so it wouldn't watch for, for the whole thing, but uh, only for those objects that matches the labels of the, of the bot where the application is running. Um, and then if the config map contents change, this, this beam will be refreshed. It will be this post and will be recreated, and the field will be initialized with a new value. Yeah? So far, so good? Um, so that's about it. And the actual uh, methods implementation are um, uh, using the uh, official Kubernetes API to create the objects. So this is not really relevant. Uh, it is on GitHub if you're curious. But it's not the point um, that I want to make, right? Now, uh, let's go back to the terminal and see if we can uh, create this. Uh, okay, so we don't have anything here, so let's apply. So this is key, okay, apply. I'm going to create this custom resource that I showed you before. And now you can see it took, it was like instant, right? I think uh, the default is every second. Uh, the reconcile loop, it can be configured. So we have a few things here. We have, this is the, the AD, uh, ABCDB object with the message, right? This is the message that I have in the YAML file, yeah? The config map, the deployment, the service, and the, po uh, the pod with the application. So my database has been installed. So far, so good? Yeah? Now, I think um, I won't be able to call this. Oh, I can now. OK. This is great. Uh, so we have this message, hello from a CRD running in a Kubernetes cluster, which means that um, this, uh, so the application is aware that it's running inside Kubernetes. and this is the message coming from the config map. It's not the default value. Remember that? Not the default value. So it's reading that from the config map. Now, let's refresh this. So k minus n. We are going to edit with kubectl this. I'm not going to edit the config map directly. I could do that, right? But I don't want to do that because my operator doesn't work with the config map directly. The config map is just one of the pieces that it will manage, right? What I need to edit is the, the custom kind, the custom resource definition, right? So let's do that. This is the, the live object that is deployed on, on Kubernetes. So you see uh, different controllers will create some annotations and, and labels, labels, sorry. Um, my operator is actually using some annotations to tell, for example, this object has been reconciled already. Uh, it was re reconciled at this time, right? So this is the, like, the control logic it uses to, to be able to tell, uh, because otherwise you would uh, be constantly you know, creating objects, right? And now if we go back to the spec, We're going to change this. Oh, yeah, Brian. We're going to save this. And then we're going to call it. And we have, hello, yeah, Brian. <laughs> the, what do we have here? Let me run it again. So this is the custom resource. 
it's got the new message, right? The operator kicked in when this object changed. Uh, it knew that the object was already reconciled, so then it went to check the, the state of the three objects it's going to manage. And when it checked the, the state of the config map, uh, it realized that it needed to, cha to change the content of the config map. It changed the content of the config map, and then Micronaut, the Micronaut application, this, data, this fake database, uh, reacted to that and refreshed only that bin while the application was running. So you can, say, you can see there's zero restarts. There's no application restart. It's only refreshing that particular bin. Um, so we have some time for questions. Uh, before we get that, I have a QR code with a simple survey. Uh, there's only one question with a rating one to five, um, and then an open-ended uh, uh, field. Uh, I would really appreciate if you could give me some feedback about this, uh, this presentation. It will help me to, to improve um, future editions. Um, and then, does anyone have any question for me? There's one there. Um, actually, just the one question. So, do you think that uh, what you did in the de demo now that can be can be the same achieved by using influencer instead of the reconciler? Because it, the config map has can react by uh, by using what? So the same thing we did in the demo. Yes. With an informer. Yes. Oh, informer. Ah, informer. Yes. Uh, I think potentially yes, but an informer is an informer is meant to be different because an informer is it will never check the that an informer is more like for example um, imagine that when you do like that change you want to send an email, right? That doesn't have to do with the cluster state. Then you do that with an informer. You use that uh, callback method to do, do send, send a notification, whatever you have to do. But it, it doesn't have to deal with the cluster state. It, if it has to do with the cluster state, I think it's more correct to use a reconciler. Yeah, a pleasure. Any other question? No? Okay. Uh, thanks again. You've been a fantastic audience. I hope you enjoyed the, this conference and uh, see you over here.